Tēnā koto kato, namaste, uh, good afternoon. I'm really delighted to, to chair this last presentation of the conference and to introduce our keynote speaker. Emeritus Professor of History at Victoria University of Wellington, Sheikha Bandapadieh. Sheikha is, I'm sure, well known to everyone here as an enormously prolific and influential scholar in the area of modern Indian history. He has numerous publications with six monographs, 12 edited books, and more than 50 chapters and articles. He's um, now retired, but you wouldn't know it, <laughs> with lots of projects going on, lots of calls on his time for this sort of thing, and um, with assistance for, for other scholars. I'm very aware of that as a recipient of that myself. So thank you, Shaker. Shaker is also a life member of the New Zealand Asian Studies Society and was the founding director of the New Zealand India Research Institute. And tangentially, I'd like to thank NZIRI for their sponsorship of this keynote. So under Shaker's seven-year directorship, there was an enormous amount of Indian studies-related research carried out and disseminated through competitive research grants, conferences, and publications. The nurturing of other researchers' scholarship through NZIRI is an extension of Shaker's personal great collegiality and generosity to other scholars at all stages of their careers. I know many of Shaker's former PhD students say this, as well as, other, uh, as well as other scholars. So we turn now to Shaker's own scholarship um, and welcoming him to present on partition and its afterlife in South Asia. Turn now to you, Shaker. Thank you, Robin. Tenakoto katoap. I would like to first start with uh, my sincere thanks to NZ Asia and the conference organizing committee for inviting me to give this keynote speech. I consider it to be a great honor for me uh, to be invited as a keynote speaker for a conference of my own society with which I have been associated for the last 30 years. Um, when I was asked to choose a topic, um, I gave a topic which is uh, very close to my heart and also related to my current research activities, which is a close examination of a particular communal riot which took place in 1964. But I may as well begin from the very contemporary situation. I mean, those who watch the developments in South Asia must have noticed that just a few weeks ago in October, 2021, there were reports of um, communal violence from Bangladesh in the area called uh, Kumilla, where the minority Hindus were attacked there um, the, during the Durga Puja, which is one of the major religious uh, functions of the Bengali Hindus. And there were riots in the Kumilla areas, and it soon spread to other parts of Bangladesh. Whenever we learned or we learned about this development and the news reports started coming out, everyone apprehended that there would be a retaliatory riot in India. And we did not have to wait. Um, the Bangladesh incident took place on 13th October. And on 27th October, 2021, we had the report of the Hindu nationalist groups going on on the other side of the border in the state of Tripura, where they, had, they vandalized a mosque and then went on the setting on fire Muslim shops, Muslim houses in a large area of Northwestern Tripura. Now, those who are familiar with the history of communal relations in the South Asian subcontinent over the last 75 years would know that there is nothing surprising in this uh, incident because such incidents of retaliatory violence has been taking place ever since the Indian subcontinent was partitioned on the basis of religious demography. 
And the partition took place, as it is well known now, as a kind of final solution to the minority problem of the Indian subcontinent. And uh, it was demanded by 1940 by the Muslim League that the Muslim majority areas, this is a map based on the census of 1931, which shows that the Muslim majority areas in the Northwestern and Eastern India, uh, which the Muslim League demanded as their own separate state. But the problem was not about really the Muslim majority areas, which were straightforward. But the problem was about this lighter shades of green, which indicated the Muslim minorities leaving in the other parts of India. But the Radcliffe Commission, which was the boundary commission, which was con uh, con uh, set up in 1947 on the basis of this religious demography, partitioned both Punjab and Bengal into two nations, two initially dominions, eventually nation states. Uh, it was a kind of geographical, uh, political geographical absurdity this is West Pakistan, and here is uh, the East Pakistan initially, now Bangladesh. And this was intercepted by thousands of kilometers of territory of India. Now, this was um, expected to be the final solution of the minority problem. But instead of that, it created new minorities. Even after the partition, it, 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 it turned out that about 35 million Muslims lived in India, and about 20 million non-Muslims, and particularly Hindus, mainly Hindus, lived in Pakistan in two parts of, the, of Pakistan. And these two nation states, as I uh, will argue later on, have never been able to define a policy to deal with these religious minorities, and therefore these minorities have been held as hostages and retaliatory violence has been taking place right from 1950 until even today. So I will look at one such incident, that's a 1964 one. And the problem is that Pakistan in 1956 had the new constitution, which declared by which it became an Islamic Republic. And with the declaration of Islamic Republic, the Hindus, the minority non-Muslims and who were mainly Hindus were considered as the other of the nation. But what is more complicated and interesting is that the secular democratic India treated the, Mus the Muslim citizens in the country as equal citizens, but continued to look at them with suspicion for being Pakistani at heart. And more importantly, groups, the Hindu nationalist groups like Hindu Mahasabha treated them as hostages to be used for the safety of the Hindu minorities on the other side of the border. In this way, the destinies of the two minorities caught on the wrong sides of the border thus remained intertwined, and it is still the fact. And what happened as a result, these minorities are considered as what uh, Willem van Trendel has called the proxy citizens of an alien state. And whenever something happened against the minority on one side of the border, it was retaliated by retributive violence on the minority on the other side. This happened in a major way in February, March 1950, which was the first major riot after partition. I have discussed this riot in details elsewhere in my book earlier, so I'm not going into it. Now, what I would like to show that the 1950 incident was again repeated in 1964. And this 1964 is known as the Hajrat Bal riot. And this is a very interesting story in itself, how it, and I'll show how it was related to what I consider to be the legacy of the partition. Now, what is Hajrat Bal Rat? This is the shrine of Hajrat Bal in Srinagar in Kashmir. Now, what happened on the and the particular importance of the Hajrat Bal shrine is that it hosts a sacred relic of Prophet Muhammad, which is 
one hair from his bed, which is kind of stored in this Hajrat Balrat, Hajrat or Bal Shrine. So what happened on the 26th of December, 1963? It was reported that this relic was stolen. Now, when the report came out that the relic was stolen, it immediately sent panic. It went to the, the government, went on to the panic button. And the local residents also became panicky that this could immediately lead to violence. And it was suspected that this was kind of conspiracy from the other side of the border. So immediately in Srinagar, in the city of Srinagar, there were rallies by all the religious communities who lived in Srinagar, the Muslims, Hindus, and the Sikhs. And what is very interesting, for the next few days, entire Srinagar, entire Kashmir Valley, and the in immediate vicinity, West Pakistan remained absolutely peaceful. But riot took place in the district of Khulna in East Pakistan, about 2,474 kilometers, or really 2,500 kilometers away. So the relic got stolen in Srinagar and the riot breaks out in Khulna, not in Srinagar, not in the adjoining areas of West Pakistan. So how do we explain this? And this takes us back to partition. So when the partition happened, when the Ratcliffe Commission uh, declared its border, it was found that the Khulna district of Khulna was given to Pakistan. It was in East Pakistan, despite the fact that in Khulna, the Hindus were majority. The Hindus constituted about uh, Twenty, uh, about slightly about fifty percent of the population, and later, uh, and the Muslims later on. I'll come to this issue in a while. But what happened within on the fourth of January, uh, twenty sixth December, the relic was stolen, and from the third of January, riot broke out in Khulna, and we had it first broke out in the Khulna town where we have, we have reports of about 20 million mill workers went on rampaging and there were several deaths, several injuries, many houses and shops belonging to minority communities were vandalized or destroyed. And in the following day, 4th of January, this rioting spread to the countryside where villages were attacked by this crowd some were local, some were going from the cities, and in various ways, um, the, the panic spreads to other districts as well. And from 4th of January itself, refugees start coming into Calcutta uh, across the border to Calcutta. What is also significant on 4th of January, the relic was found. The relic was found and it was reinstated in the mosque, but that did not stop the riot. The riot st rioting still going on, and more reports of death and destruction from Khulna town and the adjoining villages poured into the city in, uh, into the city of Calcutta, and that raised in various quarters the question: Why really Khulna, and why not Srinagar and the adjacent areas? The main reason is that when the partition took place. Khulna had 50.3% Hindus and about 49.35% uh, Muslims. In spite of it being a Hindu majority district, it was placed for various reasons in East Pakistan. And when the partition had taken place, there was widespread demand from the Hindus that Khulna should actually go to India in exchange for another district of Murshidabad which had a Muslim majority population, but was placed in India. But that did not happen. Ratcliffe Commission's award was final. Once done, it was done. Um, and as a result, there was a compulsion and there was a lot of motivation to set the demographic imbalance rectified 
after the partition. And so in 1950, there was a first wave of migration after the 1950 riot, and there was a first uh, migration. But even that, even then, this migration did not rectify uh, the imbalance. But it was further aggravated by another factor originating in India. Just a few months ago, there was a kind of there was an incident in uh, Assam where the Assamese government began to drive out many Muslims, thousands of Muslims who were identified as illegal migrants. And as a result of that, the two incidents taken together, um, there was in the Khulna and other districts, uh, a, what I con consider to be a brutal contest for scarce space. And this led to this forced migration and the flagration and the rioting that took place here. What is more most important that this was being this was happening in Kulna, the refugees started coming, and with the information coming to Calcutta, there was a full scale rioting started in Calcutta from 10th of January, that is within a week. Now I was a 12 year old boy at that time, and I distinctly remember uh, what was happening, the panic in the city. And the rioting went on in the city for two days and causing 60 people to be killed. I distinctly remember I was leave, I was at that time staying in Park Sarkas region, which was a Muslim majority areas. And at night we could see the red sky, which, which indicated that some houses were on fire. But what happened in Indian case, um, the state intervened quite quickly and the home central home minister came to Calcutta and immediately deployed the army so the urban violence could be stopped within two days. But what happened, the urban violence soon spilled over to the countryside, particularly in the border districts of 24 Parganas and Nadia, where previously in 1947 and 1950, a lot of refugees from the other side had settled in. And these refugees had still had the memory of the violence and displacement which they had undergone just a few years ago. And now when the, this Kulna riot started, they took it out on, their local, on the local Muslims and the rioting took place in 24 Perganas and Nadia, which resulted in 26 Muslims and three Hindus killed and in the rioting in the district of 24 Perganas two Muslims and eight Hindus killed in Nadia. Then police firing killed further three Hindus and two Muslims in the 24 Parganas. Following this, the police took further repressive measure, particularly in the, in the border districts to against this um, the refugees who were just killing the Muslims and driving them out of their houses. And there are stories that many Muslims started living on the open field and in, in, in groups so that they could resist this, uh, these attacks on their, on their villages. Now, what is also important, this rioting after some time, within a week or so, two days in Calcutta and the rest of the countryside in about seven weeks, the rioting was stopped. But what was not stopped was the political communalization of the issue. So the, what I will now focus on is the interesting part of the politics um, of what this incident brought in. So while violence was contained, politics around the issue about the beleaguered Hindu minorities in East Pakistan continued to get heated, and the local Muslims were the targets of that propaganda of hate. On 27th of January, all the opposition parties held a meeting in Calcutta at the University Institute Hall. It was attended nearly by all prominent opposition leaders and number of intellectuals, including the, the celebrity historian, uh, uh, historian Ramesh Chandra uh, Mojumdar, 
So in this meeting, the opposition parties wanted the government of India to provide facilities for the refugees coming in and also make it easier for the refugees to come into India and to provide for them and to get it along with get it up, take, take it up with the Pakistan government for the protection of the minorities there. But this after this all parties conference, it was divided. The leftist parties the, and the Congress wanted to stop the communalization of the issue. But on the other hand, the center right groups like Hindu Mahasabha or um, even some of the uh, centrist group like Proja Socialist Party or uh, PSP or Jansang, they formed various com committees. One of the two major committees they formed, one was called the Civil Liberties Committee and the other one Save Pakistan Minorities Committee and the deliberated incited communal tension in the province. How they did it? From around February 1964, they continued to hold meetings in Calcutta in the, and in the border districts of 24 Parganas where they made statements which were unabashedly Islamophobic, demanding a forced exchange of population. And leaders of Jansang and Forward Bloc kind of condemned the government of India for its appeasement of the policy, appeasement policy towards Pakistan. And they said that the minorities Hindus were being subjected to genocide. And therefore, it was argued that what happened in, in West Bengal were compared to what happened in East Pakistan was minor incident. And the government of India was more uh, unjustifiably trying to stop what was happening in, in West Bengal. And they repeated the theory of hostage. That is one leader and one very famous leader, Leela Roy, in one meeting said, I quote, the carnage in East Pakistan would have its resultant repercussions in India, which might assume alarming magnitude, unquote. And other leaders, they demanded exchange of population. One of them said that we have to explain, expel all the 500,000 Muslims who were all suspected to be Pakistani spies with extraterritorial loyalties. Another leader, very well-known leader, Opubal al Muzumdar. He argued that the 3 million pro-Pakistani elements could be forced to quit India. If that happened, similar number of minorities from East Pakistan could be accommodated in their places. Now, these leaders also wanted the government to impose an economic sanction on East Pakistan, keep the Muslims away from the border areas and arm the Hindus in those areas to ensure the country's security. To put pressure on the government, the Save Pakistan Minorities Committee called for a half day strike on 17th of March from 4 a.m. to 4 p.m., which was a mixed success. And then the strike was opposed by the Congress and the leftist parties, and there were clashes between the two groups. And so after this partial success, they escalated the movement. They called for a direct action or civil disobedience to start from 25th of March. What happened on 25th of March, hundreds of volunteers picketed on in the road corners, and there were also protest marches on the streets of Calcutta. About 700 people, about 900 people marched towards Esplanade East, which is the central uh, administrative uh, headquarter in the state of West Bengal. And many of them were arrested. And then the volunteers squatted on street corners. Some of them staged hunger strikes. And from 21st of April, they picketed on railway tracks to stop uh, railway tracks in the border areas to stop goods trains going to Pakistan. What is also very uh, an interesting part of this, um, the whole incident was that some of, I mean, this is an ongoing debate about the position of Dalit within the commun communal relations in uh, India. And one of the major aspects of this 1964 riot that many of the Dalit, both their leaders and the peasants, particularly in the those who were refugees in the border districts, were very actively um, participating in the whole carnage. Um, but 
the arrest, when we look at the arrest, some of these Dalit leaders and some of the minor leaders were being arrested, but all the major leaders whose Islamophobic lectures were completely unabashed, they were not touched. So this was, this was going on uh, almost without restraint. But what is also the, my last point would be the human cost of this whole thing. The human cost was um, the movement of refugees. Uh, the violence in West Bengal was quickly contained and therefore there was no major Muslim exodus from West Bengal. One report um, by Joya Chatterjee shows estimates that in 10 days between 6th and 14th January, about 70,000 Muslims had fled their homes in West Bengal, but we do not really know how many of them actually crossed the border and migrated to East Pakistan. But there are now stories coming up which shows that from this time onwards, many of the Muslims living in the border districts started thinking about migrating to East Pakistan. But it is a fact, a lot more people were coming from East Pakistan into West Bengal. And there were all non-Muslims, but and coming from all religious groups, Hindus, Christians, Buddhists, and others, and mainly, but mainly Hindus. And by March, about three thousand per day were entering uh, the border districts from the East Pakistan. According to one report, the it's in 1964 about 693,000 people crossed the border into India, and of them, 419,000 or more than 60% came to West Bengal, and the rest went to the other two border uh, provinces, that is Tripura and Assam. Now, the government of India did not initially know what to do with them, but there was intense pressure from the politicians in West Bengal, and the all party conference particularly demanded that the government of India should take um, charge and of these refugees because government of India's position was that this has nothing to do with partition. Partition was part 17 years ago. But under the pressure of particularly West Bengal politicians, they agreed to provide um, shelter and um, some kind of a, um, help, uh, but it is also very significant aspect that unlike the refugees who came in 1947 or 1950, only 40% of the refugees who came in 1964 wanted state help. So what happened, the government of India decided that they cannot be settled in West Bengal and keeping them in West Bengal was a risk. So what they had done for the 1950 ref refugees, they decided to immediately take them to Dandukarano. Dandukarano, which was being developed in central India as a new refugee settlement areas. And some of them were rehabilitated in Northern uh, Andaman districts. So this is the Dandukarano, as you can see, this is West Bengal, this is Calcutta. And from Calcutta, they were being sent to this is the Dandakaran area, which were several thousand square kilometers of forest areas. And the whole idea was that these refugees would clear the forest and then they would settle down uh, there because they were mainly coming from peasant background. They were thought to be the best suited person to clear the forest, settle the and um, colonize the land and settle down there. So what happened? From the border post, they were taken to Sialda Station in Calcutta, and from Sialda Station on special trains, they were straight taken to Madhya Pradesh. Uh, that is, and so this Dandakaran area incorporated several states that is, Orissa and ja today's Jharkhand, Maharashtra, and Andhra Pradesh. So they were taken to there, first to Mana Camp. This is a, a, a picture, rare picture, which says from Manakam. So from Sialda, they were, the train would take them directly to, to the Manakam. And the Manakam, they, they would be settled there for 
temporarily because Mana Camp was designed as a temp as a transit camp. But what happened? It, the Mana Camp was set up in a airfield, World, Second World War airfield, and it was constructed for about ten thousand families. But by March nineteen sixty four, the the Mana Camp was full, and the reports that we have seen about the conditions in Mana Camp was really appalling. And I will just quote one letter, the letter written by a very well-known social worker, uh, Ashoka Gupta, who was working in the Mana Camp. And she is writing to Mrs. Mathai, who was the chairperson of the Central Social Welfare Board. And as she writes, um, the situation is getting bad to worse daily with the influx increasing up to a thousand per day. As her reports further points out, the concentration of so many refugees in a small area raises many problems of sanitation, water supply, hospitals, schools, markets, and shops, particularly with regard to health, with thousands of families living in tents and directly under the sun in a congested area and in indigent circumstances, the situation was alarming and fast getting out of control, particularly affecting children and aged people. But no help was forthcoming from the center immediately and the situation got even worse. By August, about 19,000 refugees desert, deserted from the Mana camp. So the government ultimately entered, uh, started another camp which was known as the Mandala camp in Jawalpur area, Madhya Pradesh. And the situation in, those, in that camp was equally worse. We have a report that between May and August, um, about 114 children died in those camps. The other issue was to how to resettle. I mean, Mana camp, Mandala camp were transit camps where they were housed temporarily, but how to settle them permanently. For permanent settlement, there was no land which the government of India could find. They appealed to various province, various states like Orissa, Madhya Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, Madras, and so on, for additional land where these refugees could be settled, but nothing was coming forward. So in these transit camps and in various places of Dandakarana, these refugees spent uh, months and some of them even years. By November 1964, the government claimed that about 750,000 refugees had crossed over to India. So in other words, and there was no, they, they were struggling to find means for proper economic rehabilitation of these refugees. So in other words, it's a, just a snapshot of the human cost of this retributive violence that took place just to rectify some of the imbalances created by the partition and the Ratcliffe Commission's award. So how do we conclude this story of the reenactment of partition related violence and displacement 17 years after partition? The sufferings of the Bengali Hindus in East Pakistan are no longer a suppressed chapter of history as claimed by a BJP leader recently. On the other hand, recent research has also revealed a parallel story of ghettoization and marginalization of the Muslims in secular West Bengal. However, both these stories need to be situated in their transnational context, which reveal their interconnectedness. The reciprocities of behavior of the two nations to their minorities only indicated the contrived nature of partition purporting to change the communal political geography of the Indian subcontinent. As the histories of the two nations remain bounded, so were their futures. The riots of 1950 and subsequently of 1964 only indicated that the partition far from solving the problems of minorities had created new minorities and fresh problems as both nations desperately search for homogeneity in social contexts that were intrinsically pluralistic. In Pakistan, that beca which became an Islamic Republic 
under a new constitution in 1956, the non-Muslim minorities were more directly and overtly treated as the other of the nation. In India, which adopted a secular constitution in 1950, the attitude to the Muslim minority remained more ambivalent and therefore more problematic. The Nehruvian idea of secularism based on the notion of individual citizenship was yet to strike a chord in popular mind in those early days of freedom, and it is questionable whether it ever did. This does not mean that communal relations at the institutional or quotidian levels had been irretrievably debased, notwithstanding the lingering sense of distrust. But there was undoubtedly a hesitation to accept the Muslims as members of the putative nation or as true believers in the Indian nationhood. And so the two minorities on both sides of the borders were held as hostages for each other's security and retributive violence on them never stopped. Anthony Smith has argued that states, I quote, states, nations, and nationalisms do not often coincide. It is the aim of, an, of all nationalists to create the conditions for a greater congruence between state, nation, and nationalism. In this quest, they have been only partly successful, but this serves merely to spur nationalists to greater e efforts, unquote. These efforts in some circumstances led to what Arjuna Padurai has called, I quote, the anxiety of incompleteness in the minds of the majorities, resulting in riots and programs as they looked at, I quote, an unsullied national whole, a pure and untainted national ethnos, unquote. Following Hannah Arendt, he has argued that, I quote again, the idea of a national peoplehood is the Achilles' hill of modern liberal societies, unquote. It will perhaps not be unjustified to say that none of the post-colonial nation states in South Asia have been able to overcome this weakness, and therefore the minority communities have continued to live at the margins of their putative nation spaces under a con constant shadow of suspicion and with an ever-present sense of insecurity, even 75 years after partition, that sense of insecurity still con continues. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Shaka. It's wonderful. It gives us uh, here yeah, with with your deep knowledge of um, of of the history and other specialized areas. You can shine such a light on this. Now, I'm going to. People have the opportunity to ask questions now. Are we until um, five fifteen? Um, you're welcome to put um, questions into the chat, into the Q&A, you can raise your hand, and also I'm going to go through the list of attendees inviting people to be promoted um, to presenters, and then you'll appear on the screen in the gallery. Okay, so I'll just go through the list. So feel free to um, put questions up in the meantime. Excuse me if I invite you a couple of times, but I'm just trying to get through the list, the list shifts around. If you turn your um, videos on, we can see you in the gallery. Aha, good, thank you. Okay, there's still a few more coming over from one to the other, but I'll go click through again um, shortly. Now, does anyone have uh, any questions? Would like to raise your hand? 
or just turn off your um, turn off the mute and speak. You're welcome to just do that. Sita, please go ahead. Thank you, Shekhar. That was really, as always, and as expected, always so very useful, just because of how much uh, depth you apply to your analysis of this context. What I found very useful, because I hadn't really thought of it, and maybe because I wasn't um, as familiar with the scholarship as you are in that in this in this space, is that idea of being held hostage and the retributive justice as always there, as always a tipping point waiting to be triggered. Um, and that makes so much sense now when you think of it as the basis for other events that have occurred across the subcontinent uh, over different temporalities, but really after, in the aftermath, in this long aftermath of post-partition. And it's almost like thinking about the Bengal famine and trying to mark a point of ending and saying, this is the period of the Bengal famine, but it really doesn't work because when this famine starts and stops is, is contentious. And the same can be said about partition, that the partition never ended in so many different ways. Um, I, I don't have a question as much as the extent to which this idea of being held hostage is also weaponized, consciously weaponized in contemporary politics. Um, and, and it seems there is awareness of this possibility because of the ways in which the the, the citizenship mandates have been set out, the National Register of Citizens, and then the offering of, um, of a path to India to particular minorities rather than anybody who may seek refuge. So, so if you could speak a little bit more about the weaponization of this politics under the current regime in India and, and how dangerous, how volatile that is um, in the in contemporary situation there. Well, thank you, I mean, this, this whole idea of hostage starts from 1947 onwards. When I was researching on the 1947-52 period, the first five years of um, freedom and first five years of decolonization, my major question was what decolonization really meant for various people. And I came across files of letters in uh, police intelligence reports, in police intelligence files. Now, the, the police intelligence department in India had a custom that all important political leaders all the letters they received, all the letters they wrote, intelligence department kept copies of all those letters. They were collected from the post office. Now in those copied letters, I found hundreds of letters written by ordinary citizens from villages, um, district towns and so on. They were writing to their leaders that now the partition has happened Muslims have got their Pakistan. So why this Muslims don't go there? And why do the leaders of Congress and other political parties tolerate that? Why just we don't have an exchange of population, we send them back and we rescue the beleaguered Hindu minorities who are suffering in the other part of the country, uh, the other, on the other side of the border. Now, when the 1950 riot took place, <clears throat> there was, Nehru had a pact with the Pakistani Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan, which is known as the Delhi Pact, to stop the violence. 
but you know what what was the major propaganda which was done in uh, east pakistan that don't touch the hindus if you touch the hindus muslims in west bengal will be slaughtered so and this was a kind of rhetoric which is coming up again and again in the public space in the lect in the speeches of the right wing um, kind of political leaders right from the 1948-50 period. So, and <clears throat> not many historians have identified it like that, but I have mentioned it very clearly in my book on last book on decolonization, and it will again be emphasized in my coming book on the later period in the post-1950 refugees, that this has been a rhetoric which was there in the right-wing Hindu nationalist discourse from almost the very beginning of the Indian Republic. So the weaponization, what I find today, is not surprising. It has a long history, and the history goes to the 1950s. And this is not just Bengal. Recently, there is a book on Sindh as a comparison between Sindh and UP. There was a lot of refugee influx from the Sindhis were migrating to, and settling in UP. So there was a lot of retributive, particularly in the 1950 riot, there was a lot of retaliatory and retributive violence, both in Sindh and UP. So the migration from these two areas were very linked up. So in other words, this is a, Kind of so, and that is why I, I started with the recent incident, what happened in Bangladesh during the puja time in October 21. And whenever that happened, there were apprehensions in the West Bengal media, as well as those who know, that there is something definitely going to happen here. And it did not have to wait soon, within days, there were retaliatory violence. Its implications are dangerous. It will, its implications can be contained if the state intervenes. Mm. The Nehruvian state was intervening to contain the violence. The 1964 riot in Calcutta was stopped within two days. The right-wing leaders were not very happy about the deployment of army to stop the violence. But Nehru sent Nanda, the home minister, he brought in the army, stopped the violence in two days. If the state wants to intervene, the stop the implications of this kind of weaponization, then the damage can be controlled. But if the state supports it, it goes out of control. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> But my major contention is, as a historian, is that what we see today has its historical antecedent going back to at least 7,500 years. And <clears throat> this is also something which I say in other, which I've said in other context, that the kind of what we see today in India, many academics are very concerned all these trains can be traced back to the 1950s. It is from the 1950s the rot had set in. The poison tree had been planted. We are now getting the fruits. I'm not sure whether I have satisfied you, but that's a brief yes. response. Thank you. Thank you. That was a good, good comprehensive response. Do we have any other other questions for Shekhar? Shekhar, I'm intrigued. Oh, I think Graham. Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, no, you go, Robin. Mine, mine's not okay, a very good question. Okay, and then you come after. Okay. Uh, I'm like intrigued that as a 12-year-old, um, you saw the sky turning red with the riots. Mm. Um, when did you think about um, going back and revisiting the – or? Re revisiting it through your scholarship, what was happening there as a 12-year-old. Was it something that has stayed with you this time or came up through other, uh, other research? Um, 
what I, what I remember, I mean, it, it was a kind of strange coincidence. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Before the riot started, we, I, with my mother, were visiting my maternal uncle's place, my, what we Bengalis call Mamabari, Mamabari. That is my maternal grandfather's place, which is located in Park Sarkas, and which is also close to a police station, the Karaya police station. Now we went there, we spent the night, and next day we heard that the rioting had started. So my grandfather would not allow us to leave the house. So we were all confined in the house, but we were otherwise safe because it was close to our police station. But I still remember one scene has stuck in my mind that after the nightfall, my maternal uncle, my mama, would take me to rooftop. And from rooftop, we could see the sky being red. And that, that picture of red sky has stuck in my mind. And we knew that this, those were the houses of Muslim slums nearby in, in Park Sarkas. Those slums were being set on fire. So that's the childhood memory I still have, but otherwise we were safe. So it didn't really, we were not panicking. So when, as a scholar, I visited those situations, I knew that that was real. That was real. It is not anything which is being imagined by the notorious left liberal intellectuals. So, and who are now the villains. <clears throat> so in other words, um, yes, I, I can in a way relate to that, although it did not kind of affect me very, very directly. But I have also family memories of partition, but that's a kind of different subject. But that was my personal experience in a right situation. Yeah, thank you, Shekhar. No dancers there. Um, with, a, with an right. interesting story, which I'm always yeah. interested in. <laughs> Um, Graham, would you like to ask your question? Well, I will if no one else has got a better question than mine. Shaker, that's a, that's a great story. That is the, um, that's the first paragraph, the first page of the introduction to your book, I think. It should be. It would make a, make a good start. Um, this, is kind of a, this is kind of a stupid question, I suspect, in a way. Um, what, not to, no, not just while you were talking. I've been thinking a lot all through the year about the farmers' protests in India and the scale of them and the enormity of them and the dedication of them and ultimately a sort of a, a victory of sorts. We'll see what, what comes next. Um, and if my question really is about... And then you've, you've told the story about, about people coming out on the streets and doing stuff when there's trouble and, and, you know, this long history of communal, what you call communal violence, but there's not just a, a history of that. There's a, there's a history of very public protest, of coming out on the streets to demand this and object to that. And what, what I'm sort of asking, I think, is, is, this, is there something very Indian about this? It doesn't just go back to that. 1950s, it goes back to, I mean, Gandhi in a way started it. Maybe it goes back before Gandhi. And it's it's not uniquely Indian because, you know, we do it here when we have lockdowns and Brian Tamaki does it and all sorts of people, everybody, everyone does it in a way, but there seems something, is there something deeply and profoundly Indian about about the way this, this happens? Does India have a culture of public protest that is somehow different from anyone else i don't know you know it's not it's not a very good question you probably don't have, have much of an answer for i don't expect an answer really um i don't expect you to be able to answer it uh, 
I, I, I only reflect on what you uh, what you said about mass protests. What I find, I find two interesting aspects of mass protests in India. On the one hand, even in 1964, and you have other instances before, when in 1964, the, the right wing Hindu nationalists started protesting on the streets. As I mentioned, at the same time, the leftist parties were opposing all that thing. And the leftist parties also had their parallel kind of mass demonstrations to oppose that kind of thing. This pluralism is unique. I mean, this pluralism is the most interesting part of this whole mass protest. As I mentioned, that um, when the Hajrat Bal incident first took place, that is, the relic was reported stolen, immediately what happened in Srinagar was that members of all religious communities, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, they came together. There were peace rallies for two days. And there was, as a result of that proactive role of this interfaith religious um, groups, nothing happened in Sri Lanka. And in Khulna it happened, and that's my major contention, was not because of religion. And that was because of the demographic situation, a demographic anomaly that left unsolved by the Radcliffe Commission. And the demographic an an anomaly was based on that whole religious argument uh, about religious demography. So in other words, it was the rioting took place more in my understanding, more as a scare, as a, as a severe co competition for scarce land and resources. And because there were, as this has been shown for Punjab as well, when, when, when one group of refugees come, it creates another group of refugees. Because once, in order to accommodate the incoming refugees, there had to be an outgoing group of refugees. So the space is vacated and taken over by the other people. The same thing happens in 1964. Um, there was a kind of displacement from Assam to start with. And the Assamese government found that there were lots of thousands of so-called illegal immigrants who were pushed out of India into Pakistan, and they spread over uh, the East Pakistan. They were looking for land, and the same argument came. The Hindus should go back to India, and this land should belong to us. So there was, in other words, this, there's a whole circular argument going on here. And the tradition of mass protest, and this is well known, in the whole in, in in the in Indian political circles, that organized mass protest starts with the Gandhian movements. I mean, Gandhi kind of set the tone of nonviolent protest movements in the subcontinent, and in India, in the political space, in the political discourse, whoever organizes such peaceful mass demonstrations, they call it Satyagraha. The term became a kind of pop, very popularly used term in the political discourse of mass mobilization. So in India, <clears throat> starting from the 1920s, there were attempts at mass mobilization in around um, 1905 8 but that failed. But after the coming of Gandhi from 1920s, this tradition of mass mobilization kind of started, and this was going on. So in other words, if you ask me to historically trace the origin of this tradition of mass movement, I will take you to the non-cooperation movement in 1920 by Gandhi. <laughs> But once again, Gandhi was not doing anything very novel. There were peaceful mass protests in other parts of the world as well. Where Gandhi was, where Gandhi was innovative was that he could 
it was his significance was in terms of mobilizing a huge number of people. Other mass movements did not have that kind of magnitude. Thank so, you. Yeah, that's my rambling. <laughs> not at all. Thank you. And Thanks that takes us perfectly to time. Um, so I'm sorry, I know there are a couple of people who were keen to ask another question, but we probably have people waiting in the other room for our um, final, for our closing address. So I'd like to thank you, Shaker, for, as expected, a wonderful, um, very uh, yeah, wonderful um, recitation of that period. Thank you very much. Thank you.